All right, I guess I need to move this out of the way so y'all can see over here, right? In the way a little bit. Good deal. Well, we didn't get done last week because I had way too much fun with <laughs> these different views uh, that we've been looking at. We've, we've looked carefully at what the Bible teaches um, about these doctrines of the faith. And uh, so I wanted to do that before we looked at the theological systems. It just makes sense that if you want to be able to evaluate uh, what deviates from Scripture, you ought to study the Scripture first, right? I mean, it's just like the, you know, the, the uh, um, federal authorities looking at uh, counterfeits, you know, and being able to identify the counterfeits. What they do first is they study the real thing to the degree that they're able to spot the counterfeit when the counterfeit is presented. And so that's what we've been doing since last, gosh, I want to say November. We started studying biblical doctrine. We went through the doctrine of God, uh, the Father, God the Son, uh, God the Holy Spirit, particularly as to how those members of the Trinity interact with us when it comes to salvation, how a person is saved. And then we looked at the creation of uh, mankind, the fall, and the impacts of sin on us. Uh, and we discovered that um, both Adam and Eve were able to hear God, and they were able to respond to God even after they had sinned, contra what we're hearing from the Calvinists who say that you're dead in trespasses and sins, and so therefore you're like a corpse. You can't hear, you can't see, you can't respond in any way to God. Now, certainly we can't respond to God um, as far as, you know, on our own. We have to have, the, the Holy Spirit does have to come and draw us to Christ. And we did admit that there is that element to it. So we looked at the scriptures and now we've begun looking at the theological systems so that you can spot the counterfeits more easily. And last week we talked about, and this is the rub really on the screen, the whole deal is about where do you stand on divine sovereignty, God's control over everything, and His giving us free will, free choice. How, how free are we? You know, that's the question. And so we've talked about the fact that it's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of paradoxical when you look at these two biblical truths and you put them together they seem to be in conflict with one another. And yet the scripture makes no effort to resolve this apparent conflict. And I, I'm convinced it's not a conflict. I mean, it's just how it is. And we don't understand it because we're not God, okay? Uh, but there are people who are smarter than me who claim to understand it. And we've looked at some of their, their theories. But when you look at what the Bible teaches, you see both divine sovereignty and human freedom put side by side in Scripture with no uh, effort to resolve that apparent conflict. The tension is what I like to call it. Uh, we looked last week at the, the Scripture from John chapter 1. How verse 12 uh, indicates that Who's it dependent on? Who's salvation dependent on as far as decision making? God makes the offer. Christ's death is there. But the person is responsible for receiving that, right? Uh, to, to as many as received him, to them he gave the, the power to become the, the sons of God, the children of God, to those who believe in his name. But then verse 13 right after it seems to indicate that who's it dependent on? Not on your will, but on... God's will. So there you have in the same passage the tension, as I like to call it. And you certainly see that in Paul's writings as well. I mean, you look at, uh, at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. The very first verse there, verse 12, seems to indicate who is it dependent on. Work out your own salvation. It seems to be dependent on you. But who is at work in you, both the will and the do of whose good pleasure? God is. So you see, they're together. Same passage of Scripture. You have this tension side by side with no effort to resolve the tension. I like to put it in terms of a te two telephone poles out there. Two great truths that are held together by the wire there and there's tension between that telephone those two telephone poles by means of the wire and so I'm going to place these four theories on this line 
as we look at them, uh, these four theories. And again, that's the question of the ages. How do, how do these things work? You, these, you got these two truths, they seem to be in tension. How do they work together? And, in, and inquiring minds want to know, right? <laughs> that, that's how that's how we are. We, we've got to discover that. And that's the way God made us in His image. He made us with intelligence and He made us to want to inquire into these deep truths, you know, into which angels fear to tread and yet there are some people who boldly tromp uh, <laughs> Uh, to, to, to come up with some solutions. And I told you last week, there, I've got here uh, these four uh, that uh, we're going to look at. And we looked uh, last week uh, at Augustinian Calvinism. And the reason I call it that is because Calvin got most of his uh, theological concepts, his background, uh, was in the study of Augustine. And, um, you know, he, he quotes him 4,119 times. In fact, he claims that the sum of my theology comes from St. Augustine. Uh, so, you, you get that belief of divine determinism, the belief that God unilaterally and meticulously determines everything that happens from eternity past so that everything is already scripted out. That's his view, Calvin's view, and that's the view, of course, of Luther, though he didn't really advertise it as well as Calvin did in his institutes, uh, but really it was Augustine. The first 400 years of the church let the tension exist without trying to resolve it. It was St. Augustine, through being influenced by pagan philosophy of Stoicism, and heresy, Gnostic Manichaeanism, um, the Manichaean ph uh, philosophy, uh, that he came up with this divine determinism that where everything scripted before anything happened in the world that was created or you came to be. It was all decided. So we'll look at that. That's, that's later. But just very quickly, we looked at the fact that God has already done it. It's a done deal. There's nothing that we can do um, to change that. They have a very strong view of divine sovereignty. We looked at several scriptures, a couple from Isaiah. I declare the end from the beginning, verse 10 of 46. And from long ago, what is not yet done, my plan will take place. I will do all of my will. It is scripted. It's done. There's not one thing you can do. And so therefore, God orders our steps. God controls our breath. God ordains the days that we're going to have before they even come to be. And so very strong view of divine sovereignty, right? And so how have they resolved that? Well, they basically say that, you know, you're not free in a libertarian sense, but you're only free in the sense that you're going to do what God has hardwired you to do. And in fact, there are atheists today who believe that basic, basically they believe in the same kind of determinism. They don't believe in God, but they do believe that your nature is hardwired just like an animal's nature. We talked last week about the fact that a fox makes a nest the same way a fox has made a nest for hundreds of years. I mean, just hardwired to do, you know, what it does. Mating rituals of birds and everything else. It's just hardwired into nature as to what they do. And the same thing is true of you. You're just a little bit on a higher scale, but the atheists believe that you're determined. So did Calvin. You're determined to do what you do. And they call it compatibilism. And essentially, uh, it's the belief that his predetermination and meticulous control is compatible with your voluntary choice because you're just going to choose what your nature has determined you to be and to choose and to do. So, um, and, and there's Calvin's quote that I gave you from last week. We deny that choice is free. That's all you need to know. Right? That's all you need to know. And so within his scheme, <laughs> sometimes I use these words very particularly, don't I? Within his scheme, uh, you have uh, two different groups that have been determined, okay? Reprobate humanity and elect humanity. Those that have been chosen to be damned and those who have been chosen 
uh, to be saved. And if you doubt that I'm being too hard, if you think I'm being too harsh with that characterization of scheme and damned and you know elect uh, to be lost and saved, there's his quote. If you want to stand with that guy, have at it. I'm not going to. <laughs> I can't do that right there. Okay, so. That's, uh, that's the belief. And so I came up with, uh, with an acrostic that kind of describes uh, where they are. And some of you got it last week. Duped. <laughs> but that is their, their belief. Divine unilateral predeterminism of eternal destinies. Duped. Um, so that's what they believe. I just simply gave it an acrostic so that you would laugh. But it, sorry, going over heads. I'm sorry. But here's another one that uh, that I've seen, and that is sovereign targeted unilateral predetermination of individuals' destinies. Uh, but that's a little mean, so I won't do it. But here's 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 our, this is this slide is just for Ernie right here. This is what they believe, right there. There it is. Uh, the puppet on a string, they believe in hard determinism. Now, where do they fit on the, on the power line here, or the telephone line? Where do they fit? They're way hard over here toward divine determinism, right? They believe everything's, it's, it's done deal, script has been written, before you were born, you have no real free, libertarian free choice. Okay. What they do with Adam and Eve, that's another situation. They really can't deal with, with that because God created them with a free will but without a sinful nature. So they're not quite sure what to do with that. They just say that's a special circumstance. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to hear them uh, play scriptural twister when they get to that one. But Anyway, so we talked about that last week, and I'm going to move on because I want to get to the last two, right? Um, so we talked about Arminianism. And again, this is, this is uh, kind of the, the response to Calvinism. Uh, Jacob or Jacobus, Jacobus Arminius, James Arminius, um, is, was a Dutch theologian who, was, who came a little later on the scene. And he reacted to some of the some of the you know deterministic elements of Calvin's system, and felt like that you know we we need to give freedom a little bit more credence here in that tension that we see in the scriptures, and so he says people do have the ability to do otherwise uh, in free situations, and they're not causally determined by God to do everything that they do. There's genuine human libertarian freedom to do an act or refrain from doing that act. So there's real choice. And this view, of course, is, way, is further out toward that human responsibility uh, on the line. And you remember we looked at several scriptures, you know, choose uh, life so that you can live, uh, choose, choose you yourselves this day whom you'll serve. You know, there's lots of scriptures about the fact that we have the freedom to choose. And we looked at, uh, you know, 1 Kings 18 and uh, Elijah presenting the choice. He says, how long are you going to hop between branches? You know, that's what the Hebrew says there. Uh, you know, if, if Baal's God, follow him. If Yahweh's God, follow him. And uh, Ezekiel, you know, that God is just pleading with the people, why will you die? Why don't you choose to repent and come back to me? Because I don't have any pleasure in the death of anybody who dies. Turn and live. And so Arminianism um, really emphasizes uh, the freedom of the will. And um, so how do they explain divine sovereignty? Well, they just say, well, God knows what's going to happen in the future. So he simply then foreordains that future. Which really means not much. <laughs> he knows what's going to happen, so he foreordains it based on that. So on the basis of his knowledge of what people will do, he ordains that to happen. Uh, but it in no way determines it to happen. He just knows what people are going to do. And so he's, he gives an illustration of a rich man um, offering you know, a beggar um, 
food, uh, money for food, and he's talking about the fact that the very act of reaching out and receiving it is not a work, okay? That you have the ability to receive what is given to you just like you have that ability in salvation. God makes the offer of salvation. You have the ability to receive that offer. And so he, but he's saying, though, that with, with faith, God does have to help us. There needs to be that, um, there needs to be that prompting by the Holy Spirit, that drawing, you know, John 6, 44, uh, so that uh, that happens. And so to put it in a kind of a schematic here, um, I've got a, a, where it crosses over. God's sovereignty and, and our libertarian free will, our free choice is enabled by God. Um, there is what, they, what he calls prevenient grace so that that John 6.44 passage, uh, you know, no man can come to, the fa come to me unless the Father draws him first. Okay, so there's this drawing grace that has to happen. So in the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit makes that alive to the sinner who hears, and that prevenient grace then enables you to come to the place where you can choose yes or no. Uh, yes, I'll follow Jesus, or no, I won't. So that's, that's what, the, uh, what's what the Arminian believes. Now, um, so I would call that uh, soft libertarian freedom because there's still a divine sovereign element in it, right? So it's not hard libertarian freedom where you're just completely disconnected from God in the process of salvation, uh, like they claim Pelagius believed, but that you have to be prompted by God in that provenient grace so that salvation can happen. Does that make sense? You're looking at me a little quizzically, but does that... I'm tr and I'm rushing through it because we talked about it last week, but for the benefit of those that you didn't get to hear, or maybe it was just totally confusing. What they were referring to when people feel convicted? Yes, yes, convicted, exactly. Convicted by the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit takes place. That is, con that is what he would say is prevenient grace. That's God's grace prompting you, preparing you to receive the gospel or to reject it, as the case may be. So... So that's, that's what they believe. And, and again, I told you, let me put them on the line here where they are. They're not all, all the way over to the human free will side because they believe God has a role in salvation that is absolutely critical. You can't just be saved whenever you want to. You're saved when that conviction happens, when the prompting of the Holy Spirit happens, not outside of that, okay? So that is the Arminian view. Now the problem with the Arminian view is that they make foreknowledge um, what God has ordained. The, the fact that God knows something's going to happen, um, He just ordains it to happen. So how's God going to direct His plan for the world? I mean, it, you know, He must, in the Arminian view, again, like I said last week, he must have stepped back and said, man, I'm glad that all worked out with Pilate and the condemnation of the cross. And I'm just, man, I'm just relieved that that all just kind of fell into place the way I was hoping it would fall into place because I've got all these free creatures here and I knew that was going to happen in the future and I ordained that to happen. But man, I'm glad it didn't work out any other way. Therein lies the problem with the Arminian position, okay? Because we have seen that God knows, the, He not only knows the end from the beginning, but he's going, His plans are going to work out. He has a plan that He is working out that, and we looked at it. I mean, it, you know, we read the scripture last week. What was it from, um, from um, Acts chapter 2? I think it's verse 43. We also read from Acts chapter 4, I think you read, uh, verse 27, I think it was, or 24, I can't remember, 27, uh, where, you know, he, uh, Peter is praying back to the Lord, and he's saying to the Lord, you know, Pilate, Herod, the Romans, the Jews, they all did exactly what your, plan, your foreknowledge and your plan was beforehand. So very specific people 
very specific circumstances were in God's plan from the beginning. So there was a divine direction of everything leading up to the cross. The cross itself was not a, wow, I'm glad that worked out moment, but it was a divinely determined moment, right? Can we all agree on that based on that scripture? If we want to go back and read it again, we can. But God very clearly says in his word that he planned this thing out through people. So the Arminian really doesn't have a good answer for that, to be honest. And, and, and the funny thing is, is that, you know, somebody who will watch this video later, you know, they, they, they were, you know, all these videos that we've been doing, ah, he's an Arminian. In fact, one of your friends over at that church that we talk about all the time, um, they call me an Arminian. I'm not. <laughs> To the camera, I'm not an Arminian. Okay, I, 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 it has its weaknesses too. Okay, just like the Calvinist position has its weakness. Um, I'm content to allow the tension to exist without trying to resolve it. Okay, and that's what I'll say at the end for those of you who go away for choir. Uh, <laughs> so just to give you that preview, if you don't watch the video. All right, let's go to a different view. Okay, because I, I need to move on. And this is one that's become popular uh, really recently, like in the 90s, I think, some Christian uh, ph philosophers uh, kind of rediscovered this view of what is called Molinism. Molinism. And I've already been called that uh, by, by somebody as well, so just, just a spoiler warning here, but I'm not. Uh, so anyway, this is, this is named after a Jesuit Catholic who was a counter-reformer. In other words, he was kind of pushing back on Luther and Calvin and the Reformation. So he's a Catholic guy. And his name, Luis de Molina, and he ministered mostly in Spain. And his work um, triggered a big controversy within the, the Roman Catholic Church because you had a couple of different big major groups within Catholicism. You had the Dominicans who followed uh, the teaching of Thomas Aquinas and then you had the Jesuits and they kind of went along with Molina and I'll show you what they basically did but here's here's Molina and his his view he basically affirmed that like Arminius that people have libertarian freedom that God does not causally determine everything that's going to happen it's up to you to choose in freedom permitting circumstances whatever you want to do okay uh, but he has a different solution to the question of how God is sovereign over our decision making. He says it's not enough that God looks into the future, like the Arminian does, and sees what's going to happen. In a sense, that comes too late for God to be able to plan anything. Okay, so here we're, we're trying to find a middle ground between those two views. Uh, so he posited that God's sovereignty works with free will based on his middle knowledge. All right, so let me try to explain that uh, because Aquinas, and again, he was he after Augustine, Aquinas became the big dog in the Catholic Church with regard to systematic theology, and um, Molina is bouncing off of his proposition of two logical, not chronological. We talked about the difference in priority of those two moments in God's knowledge. So. God has natural knowledge. He knows what could and couldn't be the case. God has free knowledge. He knows what will and won't be the case. But in between those two logical moments stands God's decree or his eternal purpose, the logical moment in which he decided to create the world and decide its history, the scripting, like the Calvinist talks about, right? Both decisions and actions of creatures and God's own actions and bringing his decree into effect. So. Between those two classically agreed upon moments, he posited a third class of knowledge that he calls middle knowledge, sensia media, middle knowledge. And so it, essentially he, he proposes that God knows what all free creatures who are genuinely free will do in any given set of circumstances. And so before he launched the world and scripted it, he played out in his middle knowledge what 
Pilate would do, for example, when presented with Jesus, given his, given his, you know his upbringing, the situation in time with the conflict between the Jews and the Romans, knowing everything that he knew about Pilate as he's playing it out in his mind before he sets it, he knew what Pilate would do with Jesus, that he would go along with the people and he would condemn him. So he put him in that circumstance, but he was completely free, Pilate was, to make the decision to, to yield to the people and cru order the crucifixion of Jesus. Okay, so then God set the world that way. Now I know this is really angels dancing on the head of a pen. I get it. I, I get it. But I mean, this is how these people are, are, are thinking. So these three modes are natural knowledge of things the way, the way things could be, middle knowledge the way things uh, would be under certain circumstances given free decisions and then the free knowledge the way things will be in the future and here is a lengthy quote by this guy that will give you brain cramps uh, this is the kind of stuff I have to do to prepare for this class okay so I'm, I want to make y'all have pain like I have pain by at least putting it up on the screen for a second to show you this is the kind of stuff you have to wade through to come to these conclusions so that I can make it easy. Because I'm telling you, this gave me a brain cramp this week reading this crazy stuff. But this is, you know, what he says about it. So if you want to look at it and you want to read that and have a brain cramp, have at it. Uh, but anyway, so he's talking about contingency and what people could do, would do, and God knows all that. So I'll just keep going here, okay? Is that fine if I keep going? Because I don't want to kill you with this stuff. Uh, but here's the deal. Middle knowledge is different from foreknowledge because simple foreknowledge tells you what's going to happen, right? But middle knowledge is God's knowledge of what would happen under different circumstances. And so he maintains that before God set it into existence, he played out all the permutations of what could happen, which makes... Molina's view of God on steroids bigger than Calvin's because he knows what free creatures would do in any given circumstances so he had to arrange the circumstances so he got his ends and purposes met including Pilate including Judas including Peter when he denied Christ God knew before he put Peter out there outside you know, warming himself by the fire, he knew what Peter would do. Jesus predicted it. It had to happen that way. And yet Peter was free to make that decision to deny the Lord. Otherwise, why could God call him to account? Why could Jesus, you know, bring him up short in John at the end of John's gospel and say, Do you love me? I mean, to hold us responsible if he has divinely decreed in every meticulous circumstance what you're going to do, including your sin. Then who is sin on? It's on God. So Molina says, let's get out of that deal. <laughs> let's let free creatures make their decisions. Okay, let's let free creatures make their decisions and their decisions be on them. All right, so that's how he came to his conclusion. And he cites two scriptures, okay, two scriptures as an example for this belief. And we've talked about this scripture before, um, how David uh, went to Kila. David helped the people of Kila defeat the Philistines. David went to the Lord. The Lord said, should I go up against the Philistines? He says, yep, go up. I'll give them to your hand and so David saved the inhabitants of Kila now it happened verse 6 that when Abiathar he's the priest right uh, son of Ahimelech fled to David at Kila that he went down with an ephod in his hand now there's your divine um, consulting apparatus <laughs> it's got the dice the holy dice on it okay on the ephod you got those stones that they rolled and they came up with an answer right and so uh, David inquired of the Lord uh, when he heard that Saul was coming. Uh, and so 
Uh, it says Saul was told David had gone to Kilas. So Saul said, uh, God's delivered him into my hand, for he shut himself up by entering a town with his gates and bars. And so Saul, Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Kilas to besiege David and his men. And when David knew it, then he said, hey, bring the ephod in. We need to ask the Lord what would happen. Okay, and then David said, O Lord, God of, uh, of Israel, your servant has cer certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Kilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Kilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul com come down as your servant has heard? And the Lord said, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Now, if you're a Calvinist, that's it. That's the end of the story. He said, yeah, he'll come. But no, this is not really a done deal, is it? Because free creatures are still at work here. And so David said, will the men of, of Kilah deliver me? And, 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 and my men in the hand of Saul says, they will deliver you. It's a done deal, right? If you're a Calvinist, God's proclaimed it. It's a done deal. No, he's just simply saying, that's what's going to happen if you sit there. If you sit in Kilah, Saul's coming, and those people will give you up. If you do this, this will happen. So what is that displaying? It's displaying middle knowledge. It's displaying what not will happen, but what could happen given those circumstances. Do you see what I'm saying? And so here's what David did. said, okay, given those circumstances, I'm going to change the circumstances. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm getting out of Dodge, dude. I'm not going to stay here and get captured. So, he departed. So does that make God a liar? Because of what God told David through the ephod? No! God not only knows what will happen, and it would have happened if David had sat there, right? But God knows what would happen given the circumstances. Do you see it? All right, well, let me give you another example. Um, so, and, and there's the bottom line of it. I'll just go on. And so based on that, that middle knowledge God shared with David, uh, he knew what both Saul and the people of Kala would do in that circumstance, so he decided to leave. Now, Jesus also does this in a, in a circumstance. He expresses this sort of middle knowledge when it comes to ancient cities that were judged but that under different circumstances they would have repented. For example, in uh, Matthew chapter 11, look at what Jesus says. He pr proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because they didn't repent. Now look at this. Woe to you, children. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were done in you, if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, the object of a lot of prophecies of, of judgment and destruction, and it actually happened in history, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. But I tell you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you'll go down to Hades. You'll go down to the grave. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. So Jesus says there was a circumstance in which even Sodom and Gomorrah would have survived and would not have been judged if they had what? Repented. If they had repented. Yes? You know, do you have a problem with that whole term middle knowledge? Well, I don't like it. I don't like it, but it, it's, it's his term because he's trying to, to go between Aquinas' two different, other, the other two types of knowledge. Uh, I don't like that term, but that's the term it's been given, so it's what I'm using. Uh, if you wanted to use a different term for it, uh, you know, I would say probably a different term would be hypothetical, would be a good term, hypothetical. Not theoretical, because some of these things come true, right? But hypothetical, which means it could come true, it may not come true, depending on God's will and the circumstances that God arranges for these free creatures to act in. So you could call it hypothetical knowledge. How about that? That better for you? Well, I think he knows everything under it and everything over it. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and so I'm going to stick this group, again, completely under divine sovereignty and call it libertarian compatibilism. Because they're, they're free creatures and yet God arranges the circumstances so that they really don't have an option. He knows what they would do in the circumstances and to get his will and purposes done, he places so that they'll do exactly what he has planned for them to do. Like Simon Peter, freely denied the Lord, but he put him in a circumstance where that servant girl came and, you know, didn't I know, don't I see you with him? And, you know, and he denied, denied Jesus with a curse, you know. Uh, because of the circumstances he was placed in. And God knew that in advance, and that's why Jesus made the prophecy he did. So, this is really close to Calvinism, if, if, if you just want to be dead honest about it. So, it's not appreciably different as far as the result goes, but at least you do get to say that you're libertarianly free to decide, uh, even though the circumstances are going to guide you to make that decision. Okay, um, so could Peter have done otherwise? Not really. I mean, you know, same with Judas, right? So this, this view, while touting human freedom, is nonetheless essentially deterministic. So I'm not going to call it hard determinism. I'll call it soft determinism. And if people ask me, or people say, he's a Molinist, I'm not a Molinist. Sorry, I'm not yelling at y'all. I'm just telling the people in the camera. Anyway, so here, here's where I would put it on the, on the string, right? Um, you've got divine determinism on one and human free will on the other. It's going to be in between. It's going to be in between Calvinism and Arminianism. It's pretty close to Calvinism, really. This treat it, and this is the bane of most theologians' existence, and that is open theism. That is the, the current heresy that is, that is going around today, um, it, open theism. Uh, that is that, that the future's not set at all, that, that God has not determined pretty much anything, <laughs> that, that he loves us and interacts with us on the basis of relationship, and on that basis it's a give and take. And somewhere down the road, you know, the stuff that he talks about in the Bible prophetically will get done. But, you know, it, 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 you know it's really dependent on what you do and how you react to God. So let me, let me give it to you here as far as uh, a, a quote from Pastor Greg Boyd, who's a big proponent of this. It's the view that God, uh, that God chose to create a world that included free agents and thus a world where possibilities are real. The future is pre-settled to whatever degree God wants to pre-settle it. Do you see that? That's a little equivocation there. Uh, okay. Uh, and to whatever degree the inevitable consequences of the choices of created agents have pre-settled it. But the future is also open to whatever degree agents are free to resolve possibilities into actualities by their own choices. In other words, you're, you're in the lead. You're in the lead here and God's just kind of waiting on you to you know, make your choice and then he'll make his choice. Kind of like playing checkers. He's waiting on you on your side to make you move before he makes his move. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, in the open view, and again, I'm quoting Greg Boyd. These are not my quotes. These are theirs. So don't guys on the video look at the quote marks. Okay, I'm not saying this is my view either. I'm not an open theist. Uh, <laughs> So, but in the open view, God knows everything perfectly, including the future. This is what he says, but I've heard other ones say that he really doesn't know the future. But since the future is partly comp comprised of possibilities, God knows it as partly comprised of possibilities. In other words, God really doesn't know. The, it's just he's dissembling there, okay? God really doesn't know the future. That's what the open theist says. So the issue concerning the openness of the future is not about the infallibility or fallibility of God's foreknowledge, but rather about the nature uh, of the future, which God infallibly foreknows. So this is just double speak. Can you see that? Uh, all right. So this is Pastor Greg Boyd. <sighs> I love y'all. I really do love y'all. Th this is the kind of stuff I study. <laughs> During the week, I mean, it just drives me crazy. But anyway, the, here's here's some of the scriptures that he um, cites. Uh, you know that the fact that God changes His mind, 
in light of changing circumstances or as a result of prayer. Um, at other times, he explicitly states that his will, uh, he will change his mind if circumstances change. And we're going to look at a couple of these scriptures in depth, so just hang on. Uh, Jeremiah 18, Jonah 4, we'll look at those. The w willingness to change is portrayed as one of God's attributes of greatness. Uh, of course, you're, you're confronted then with, I, the Lord, do not change uh, in, in other scriptures. Um, so you've got that to deal with. And then um, let me give you a couple more here. Sometimes God expresses regret and disappointment over how things turn out. Remember he repented or he, he was sorry that he made man. Genesis, right? Genesis chapter 6. And then the flood came as a result of that. Okay. Uh, so there are scriptures like that. At other times, uh, he tells us he's surprised at how things turn out. I remember there's there's one scripture, and I think it's the Jeremiah. Well, no, it's Jeremiah seven. He said it didn't even enter my mind what you guys are doing. Uh, talking about Tophet, Jeremiah seven. I don't even have it on here, but if you look at Jeremiah seven, he talks about the Valley of Hinnom where they're offering child sacrifices on the god Molech. He said. That evil didn't even enter my mind. Now, to me, that's a figure of speech. God knows everything, okay? So I don't want to freak you out by me saying that. But, you know, some of this stuff is figure of speech. Some of it's anthropomorphic not, uh, wording and that kind of thing. But nonetheless, you do have these scriptures that are, that are pretty tough to deal with. I mean, honestly speaking, they are. Uh, Lord, the Lord tests his people to find out whether they'll remain faithful to him. Like Genesis 22, sends Abraham to the top of the mountain with his only son Isaac and says, sacrifice him, right? But then he says, whoa, don't do that. You know, whiplash. There's a ram caught in the thicket. I'll sacrifice that instead. And, now, and God says, and now I know <laughs> that you're willing to uh, trust me and obey me. Right, So you've got this interchange back and forth. And so sometimes God asks non-rhetorical questions. He speaks to people in terms of what may or may not happen. That's kind of more of the Molinistic middle knowledge, hypotheticals. Uh, he speaks to the future in terms of what may or may not come to pass. Um, and so let me, let, let's look at this uh, couple of scriptures uh, real quick. Jeremiah uh, 18, the potter. This is the consummate image that the Calvinist loves in Isaiah in um, Romans chapter 9 and here's the re original reference he talks about the potter the fact that the, if a potter wants to make a vessel for dishonor or for honor it's his and who are you old man to say to the potter right so the Calvinist wears that out but if you actually read the passage out of Jeremiah the context it shows quite a bit of free free will and you know, if you do this, I'll do that kind of situation. Do you see it? He says, the instant I speak, verse 7, uh, concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, pull down, and destroy it, I'm preaching judgment on that nation. If that nation, though, against whom I've spoken and, turn, and, and turns from its evil, if they repent, what will I do? I won't carry out the judgment I spoke. And the instant that I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build a planet, if I speak blessing on a nation, and it does evil, right? So that it doesn't obey my voice, then what will I do? I'll take back the blessing. So you see how human choice is working out with God's sovereignty in this. Okay, there's a, a give and a take. A and the great example, I think, is Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah, the reluctant prophet. He's told to go preach to Nineveh. He tries everything he can to get away from that assignment, gets on the ship, gets thrown overboard, uh, spends three days and nights on a foam blubber mattress inside a whale, right? He finally prays, Lord, I'll do it. And he gets spit up, and here he is, this poor guy with vomit in his hair, and he goes to the city of the great Assyrian city of Nineveh and he says yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown right but what happened the king down to the, the, the little one like that 
repented. Put sackcloth and ashes. They repented before the Lord. And what did the Lord do? <laughs> he said, I'm not going to destroy them. Right? And, and Jonah basically said, well, I knew you would do that. Because you're just good. <laughs> right? Look at it. Verse 2. He prayed to the Lord. Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to false, forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant loving kindness, and the one who relents concerning calamity. So when we say that I love the Lord, He doesn't change in His compassion. He doesn't change in His mercy. He doesn't change in His long-suffering. He always wants you to repent and come back to Him. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the God that we hold to. Not the one who said, decreed, before the foundation, lost, saved. But I want everybody to come to my son because I love you. And he is compassionate and merciful and long-suffering does everything in his power that he can without bruising your free will to get you to come to Jesus. Well, there are many other scriptures like this uh, where God changed his mind, reversed sentences on King Hezekiah, uh, the Jer judgment pronounced by uh, you know, Jeremiah. And so here's how I've kind of done the schematic on this, is that you know, you, it's a separation between us and God. We're not under his sovereignty, according to the open theist, but there's an interchange that is happening between the two, okay? There's a give and a take uh, between the two. So you can see kind of how that works out there. Now, classical theologians, uh, you know, when they look at open theism, uh, basically they call it heresy, okay, just so you know. I mean, it, it, people are pretty harsh on open theism. Um, that, you know, the fact is God does have a plan. He does know the future. What is it? Uh, Jesus said, he didn't know the day or the hour, but the Father does <laughs> when, he, when He's going to send the Son back, right? Mark 13, parallel passage in Matthew. The Son didn't have that omniscient knowledge when He was here um, like He had with the Father, but when He was here, He laid that aside, remember? And, but God's got a plan. He's got a day. It's set. It's done. We need to trust in that, but these people don't believe in that, okay? They just don't. They, they think it could play on out based on, you know, your interaction with God. Um, and again, they, they, they uh, look at, at these passages that are maybe figurative, maybe anthropomorphic, um, and they, they kind of hang on them maybe a little bit too much. But sometimes it's tough to take them that way because it's pretty plain what these scriptures announce. Again, I'm just going to say there's tension there between God's divine sovereignty and our free will. But basically, you know, they affirm the fact that there are these, what we call, what I would call a counterfactual, a subjunctive, conditional, if you do this, then I'll do that. There's lots of that in the scripture. There just is. You know, I mean, Deuteronomy 28 to 30, it's all, that's all it is. If you obey me, I'll bless you. And here's how. If you disobey me and you follow idols, I'll curse you and judge you. And here's how. I mean, there's lots of if-then propositions in Scripture. There is a lot of give and take in Scripture. But the problem with this system is uh, God has chosen to allow our free choices to impact what he does in response. It leaves the human being way too much in control of what's gonna do, what God's going to do. So that means God doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. I heard one open theist was asked by a Calvinist, um, and I've watched lots of debates on YouTube to try to figure out what these people think, uh, but, but he said, did God know that you were going to be before the foundation of the world. He asked the open theist that. The Calvinist asked the open theist that. Did, did God know that you were going to be? Did he know who you were? And he said, no. Way too many free choices between the beginning of the world till now to know that I would have exist back then at the beginning. 
sorry. I, I, I just can't. I, I can't go with the open theist on that. So it discounts God's exhaustive foreknowledge and providential direction toward his purposes. I declare the end from the beginning, says the Lord, and I believe that. Okay? So this is what I would call hard libertarian freedom. And here it is on the clothesline, <laughs> or the power line, or the telephone line, okay? It's way over here to the right on the human free will side, to the point I think that we're getting to the heresy line, okay? I almost think on both ends that you kind of get close to heresy, okay, with these views. So let me give you just a few conclusions as we wrap it up here. And here, is, here it is. If God wanted to create a universe in which every detail has been meticulously determined by divine decree a la Augustinian Calvinism, he could do it. He's God. If he wants to put us all like puppets on a string, he's got the power to do that. Just like when I first started trying to help Will practice football, and uh, we, we went head to head in the yard, now he's like this, you know, and I'm looking up at him. But back then he was like that. Now, if I'd wanted to go 100% strength up against him when he was uh, 12 years old and fixing to play, you know, middle school ball, what do you think would have happened? I could have killed him. But I pulled my punches so that I could teach him some moves because he wanted to play on the offensive line. So I tried to help him understand how to play offensive linemen by pulling my punches, by pulling back on what my physical capabilities were when he was a 12 year old. Do you not think that God could do the same thing to allow for us to have free will? So the question is, did he do it the way the Calvinists say? He, not, no question he could do that. Calvinists out there watching, yes, he's capable, he could do it that way, but did he do it that way? Is everything determined, and is our freedom just a farce? If so, who's the author of sin? That's the question they have to answer. Who is responsible for sin? If God decreed it from the beginning, He is. I got a big problem with Calvinism because of that. I can't go there. God's holy. He's not the author of sin, right? So, if God genuinely wanted to create us with genuine freedom, and His ultimate desire is that we would freely worship and love Him, because that's what He wants more than anything. He wants a free creature who freely wants to, to worship and love Him, right? then it has consequences for how he, how he exercises his divine attributes. He's got to pull his punches a little bit on the determination stuff to allow for free decisions to be made, right? And the ultimate example of how, you know, they, they, the Calvinists, he would never do that, he can't do that, it's not in his nature to do that, but already done that. Already done that in the Incarnation. When Jesus emptied Himself, He emptied Himself of divine attributes. They were held back, they were veiled, but this verse says He emptied Himself of. Now as you think of, and these are Calvinistic philosophical categories, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence. Was Jesus omniscient? He says, I don't know the day or the hour. Only the Father knows. Second coming. Was he omnipresent? Obviously, he was in one place at one time. He was not omnipresent. Was he omnipotent? Well, he says that he could only do a few miracles there because of their lack of faith, Mark 6. Couldn't do any big miracles there because of, his, because of their lack of faith. So he limited himself. So if he was able to limit himself to become 
divine, fully divine, and fully human, Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, if he could do that, could he not also design a world in which he pulled his punches when it comes to control, meticulous control, to allow for your human freedom and choice, so that if you make the choice sin, it's on you. If you make the choice to choose Christ, you can do that. Could he make a world like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And apparently he did. Because <laughs> that's what the scripture bears witness to. Right? So there it is. So, so could, he, could he hold back his sovereignty enough to allow us to have a free will and yet exercise enough sovereign direction over people's circumstances and events to get everything done he wants done? He's God. Of course he could. And he has. <laughs> so here's the last word. Trust the tension. <laughs> Don't try to resolve it because when you try to resolve it, you're going to run off in a ditch. Okay? And that ditch may be called heresy. Just trust the tension that exists in the scriptures and don't try to explain it. Because we're not smart enough. I'm not. And I don't think anybody else is either. Except God. Let's pray. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the only way that he could give a command like that is if we have the, had the capability to freely do that, it, for it to mean anything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that uh, leaves us with quite a bit of mystery when it comes to these two big things we've talked about, uh, your divine control and sovereignty over everything the way that you're working things out according to the counsel of your will, says Ephesians, um, the way that you know the end from the beginning and that you plan it all according to your will, says Isaiah. Um, but it, at the same time, you, you, you tell us, choose life that you may live. You tell us, choose you this day whom you will serve. Uh, you, you, you show us Jesus who comes along the seaside and says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And we see how some of those fishermen did get, get up and they followed him. And yet the rich young ruler, uh, when he said, follow me, he said, no. So we see both your divine sovereignty and we see human free choice in the scriptures. And, the, and those things are intention, Lord. We don't know how they work out. But there are a lot of people who think they know. And, and, and God bless them, I pray. But God, I thank you that, that you're God and we're not. Your thoughts and your ways are higher than our thoughts and ways. And we're not equal to you in understanding. But God, help us to, to just come to the place of trusting. Just trusting you because you're a good and a wise God. And we know your character and your nature from your word. And your, your character and your nature doesn't change at all. And that character and nature is to, to love us, uh, to be long-suffering toward us, to be merciful to us. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a place of repentance. But we know all won't because not all will choose to do it because you've given us that freedom. But Lord, we thank you that we do have that freedom though that when the offer is made, the gospel offer is made, and your Holy Spirit is convicting and calling and wooing and drawing, that we can, on our own free will, say yes. Thank you for that, Lord. Help us never take it for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.